Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe podcast with our entire investment committee of the Bonson Group. This is David Bonson. I'm the Chief Investment Officer here at the Bonson Group, and we are now doing, what is this, our third Investment mm-hmm. Committee third. podcast? It's our third uh, of this, where we bring the group together, and we're trying to do this weekly for you, talk about different aspects of the market and our thoughts and positioning. However, this is actually the first where we have the entire Investment Committee here together, because I believe our first week, Brian Seitel was here and Robert Graham was not, and our second week, Robert was here and Brian was not. So now we got the whole gang here together, and if you think that we are obnoxious as a group of four, you should see us as a group of five. <laughs> um, all right, guys. So uh, rather than go around the circle and take half our time, everyone saying hello, we'll just get into this organically. Uh, we are sitting here now. It's a Wednesday, and the uh, market is up about 100 points here today. It was down a bit yesterday. It was up the day before, a couple hundred down 600 Friday. I can keep going backwards all the way to the beginning of August. I actually do know the daily move of the market every day since July 31. And surprisingly, with an average intraday move of 315 points per day since July 31, the market grand total from its high level to where we sit now is only down 3-4%. Um, you, you've had 800-point down days and 600-point down days that have then kind of been made up on other days, usually 400 here and 200 there and stuff like that. So no, we're down, but it no the volatility is a far bigger story than the directional move in markets. I'll start with you, Brian. Do you think that we are in a bearish environment, a volatile environment, or a bullish environment? Oh, let's eliminate that one just for sake of argument. <laughs> between bearish and volatile, which one do you think we're in? And what's the difference between the two for an investor right now? I would say that we're in the middle of those things. So I would say, um, if you look at volatility, um, you know, the VIX was upwards of 20, a little over 20. Uh, it's back down here a little bit. But essentially, the market's trading in a range of, you know, 2,800 ish on the SP 500 to 2,950. It's kind of oscillating between the 50 and 200 day moving averages. Um, so we're kind of trading sideways. So a little bit of volatility, not bullish, not bearish, very sideways. Um, like you said, August is down a few percentage points, but, uh, you know, that's not, out, not outside the, the realm of, you know, of August right normal. now is not even down as much as May was. Yeah. 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 So, so we're working through, you know, interest rates today are low, uh, lower what 10 years at one forty six. Yeah. One thirty. Yeah. One forty six. Right. Is that the all time? One thirty six is all time, all time low. Yeah. Right. One thirty six. So cl- getting close to there. And I think that, which I think it was at for about an hour and a half Yeah. in, uh, 2004. 15, 16, mm-hmm. yeah, 16, I think. Yeah. So yeah, lower rates, you know, when you get lower interest rates, it tends to, you know, bode a little bit well for stock prices in the short term. And I think that's why markets are up hundred points today. But uh, other than that, not a lot of news and kind of trading sideways here. So Julian, what creates this kind of volatility? <laughs> well, I think it's uh, the one person in particular, yeah, is right. that giving a name? I think you call him the purchase, right? And uh, Yeah, we're and, allowed to say know. his name. We're, <laughs> we're not going to talk about individual stocks on this podcast today, but we can say individual presidents. Clearly. Uh, we only have but, one at a time in this country. Yeah. So it's, yeah. So. But I guess the, last week was all about, you know, some a lot of tweets and a lot of things coming out about the trade war. And and then it all calmed down when he took the plane to, uh, yeah, to France, to Biarritz. And then was very different uh, speech over the weekend. Even talk about uh, you know China calling him like it's not clear if, if that's true or not. But I guess the market saw that as you know positive news that maybe they're going to be a trade war, a trade uh, some trade discussions, and and I guess uh, that's why we you know kind of trading sideways, sideways because you have on one hand the Fed that's kind of helping supporting, um, and on the other hand this trade war that uh, that doesn't look any any closer from being resolved. Yeah. So, so I have I have a question about it though. President Trump has been tweeting rather heavily, and I would say erratically, since he was elected, and the market has not cared at all. Do you think right now the market cares about what he's say what what he's tweeting, or do they care about what it represents? Like that that, that there's is are they taking it more seriously now? Well, I guess they're taking seriously because there's been some, it's not just tweet without action. I mean, there's been talks of new tariffs coming in September and in, you know, in October and then back in September, some, you know, changing the rates. So there's really, I mean, this is happening. The the trade war is happening. And uh, and so it's not just threats. So it's not just, you know, erratic tweets with no consequences. It's, uh, I guess, you know, 
if you look at the inversion, you know, going the rates, the gold, all these. Uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, markers of risk are showing that the market is very concerned with what's happening. And the only thing that's uh, helping is that the Fed, you know, the market is also anticipating that the Fed will will help. And I, I guess there's today, I think, or oh, that was yesterday, maybe Dudley. The, yeah, I was just about to bring We should that talk up. about that. I mean, because mm-hmm. it we clearly... Will. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. There, there is there is something that needs to be said about that. Let me let me continue that thought um, with Dea. Uh, as far as what Julian's getting at, there is the markets are responding and not enhancing volatility around the mere tweets and the and the kind of behavioral or verbal gyrations of the president, but what's actually underneath it, real actions. Is that your view that that now we have to take the tweets seriously because he's not letting off steam? He's enacting policy from some of this. Yeah, I thought that, I thought that was a great answer by Julian. I think if some of those tweets have certain details, or uh, I'm sure some tweets are you know seem more actionable than others, and I think the market does a good job of properly discounting that. I think uh, you, you know as far as the market volatility, uh, you know uh, until there's more resolution, and it really goes back to what we talked about with uncertainty versus risk. I think risk is something that's calculable, but there's a lot of uncertainty right now about how all this is going to shake out, and business confidence has receded as a result. So, yeah, I I think this is I'm I'm sure this is consensus, but I think we'll we'll continue to see uh, this kind of all until there's uh, there's a little bit more clarity. So so Robert yeah. is the trade war. So let, the, let's let's ignore Twitter and President Trump. As a factor in this, other than the trade war, that's what is he's doing that's getting to the market. So is the 10-year at 1.46% and a modestly in and out, in and out inverted yield curve, is that all related to the trade war? Well, we looked at the inversion a couple of weeks ago, and it was all of maybe an hour or so, early in the morning that it inverted. And you know, I was looking at different yields around the world right now, and you look at where there is an inversion. You have pretty much the United States, you have Canada. And so what I'm seeing right now is a very concentrated flight to security at this point Mm -hmm. in time. Because where else would you traditionally go? You go to Switzerland, go to Japan, go to the UK. UK has elevated volatility above anywhere else right now. I mean, on this current day with what's happening in Parliament. So I think, you know, the the volatility is somewhat stemming from that illustration of an inverted yield curve in the United States. But I think the reason for it is for different factors than just U.S. growth at this point in time. And so the um, inversion of the yield curve, if there was no trade war, would theoretically still be happening? I think it would be more flat than it currently is. I think the the inversion would be more muted than what we're seeing currently. Well, right now it's inverted by half a basis point. Yeah. I mean, it's as flat as could be. So so th- there's technical factors, global mm-hmm. factors. Right. Uh, it's the, we used to call it Tina, that there is no alternative. That's it, yeah. That's why people come into the U.S. That's my oh. opinion. I agree. So, so go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I'm hearing this time is different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit with the... Yeah, well, Julian uh, actually uh, explicitly most, said it in an email yeah. to all of us last week, and I'm with him on this. I I, I think that this time is different, but but yeah. I don't like us... Uh, the When when we say this time is different, the press will often say it as, uh, uh, like, supposedly self-attesting... Um, reductio ad absurdum, like anyone saying this time is different must be wrong because right. this time is yeah. never different. Well, first of all, this time is different because it has been different before too. Mm-hmm, okay, mm-hmm. there's six out of seven past recessions, and then even that gets the the a, if a then b thing wrong because sometimes you have had a recession where the yield curve did not invert, and not every time you've had the yield curve uh, invert did we go to recession. And then you go a little further back, it's nine out of twelve. But let's say it was 10 out of 10 times that there, we've only had 10 recessions and, and 10 times the yield curve inverted, we had a recession. Both That is untrue. Right. But let's just say that were the case. So in the past, you had a 100% correlation. You still don't have causation. And you still do have, for what, fact of the matter, different circumstances this time. So I don't think that Julian or I are suggesting that it doesn't mean that we will go into recession. I think it's very possible but I also want to be intellectually honest enough to say that you have never had Germany at a negative 70 basis point yield in their sovereign debt and these kind of global flows into U.S. And I'm of the mindset that right now people are going, this is incredibly free money because it's one and a half percent. So over a negative 70, they're picking up 220 basis points. 
with all this money the central that the ECB has put into outer space, I think that the tenure could come down a hundred basis points, and their mentality wouldn't change a, a bit. That's a great point. I mean, and that's the thing. It's like you know, right now we've had this huge run on Treasuries. I mean, rates have dropped two twenty five to one forty six, and I think that the government should take advantage of it and keep doing what they're doing. And I think the Fed should lower interest rates to catch up to the rest of the world. Whether that plays out, we'll see. But at the end of the day, if they're trying to find a spot or an equilibrium in treasury yields where they're going to kind of stop the flow into the U.S. dollar, into U.S. treasuries, they have a long way to go. The rest of the world's negative. We're at 146. Okay, so it's a long way. Do they go below negative? I sure hope not. I sure hope not. I don't think that they will. And I, but, you know, I, I sure hope that that's not the case. But I, again, I mean, I politically uh, we, toxic. Yeah. And, you know, like we were talking about the recession um, indicator, the inverted yield curve. And yeah, it's, I mean, Fed funds is at. Two, 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 two to 225, 10 years at 146, that's pretty inverted if you look at it that way. Two t- two's tens are negative by five basis points, like mm-hmm. you said, but that does not tell us when the recession might be. And I think if the problem is this time is different, I, I would agree that it, the probability of this time being different is much higher because of the anomalies around the world. I mean, we've never had $16.5 trillion of negative yielding debt, and so that will cause anomalies, and it could cause things be a little different this time. That said... It doesn't mean that I'll be wrong to say that the inverted yield curve will cause the next recession because it's not a cause, it's an effect, number one. And number two, might be 18 months from now, might be 24 months from now, and you could probably pinpoint it and say, well, that was because the yield curve was inverted. So, Well, yeah, but uh, if once you start saying it could be two years, what's the point of it? No, what, I agree. I mean, it's going gonna, it, it's gonna to rain some somewhere in America in the next couple of weeks, and we'll have a recession in two, three years. So the rate... Every time it rains, they have a recession two years later. I mean, I'm making up a ridiculous... That's, that's the bull bear case on the this time is different. I could probably paint it both ways, and I could probably be, be right both ways because I could indicate different things. I think the inverted yield curve is one thing out of a, of a whole slew of different things. It's uh, so, so, Julian, you've been at this for a little while. You, this is not your first rodeo. Let me ask you a question. I know the answer, but I want to hear what your perspective. Sure. Have you ever heard people at cocktail parties and restaurants on Friday night and the mainstream media when the yield curve inverted talk about it the way they have now this has become like a household conversation yield curves inverted six of the last seven recessions nine of the last 12 this is not the first time this goes back 30 40 years and yet now it seems like everywhere you go people are like oh that yield curve inverting what do you think what's different this time why is that why is this such a big issue well um i guess what's different this time is you know the world is different this time. The rates are, you know, everywhere else. Uh, what we just said, you know, being having negative rates, um, and and um, you know the fact that you've had this QE, you've had the, the Fed playing with, you know, buying uh, bonds, and so do you have a real market? Is that does it really represent what the you know would the yield? Would there be a 50, uh, 50 bips inversion? If the Fed was not involved in in trading these securities, um, probably would be different, right? So. That's why I guess you cannot really compare what's happening this time with what happened in the past. Um, and so um, uh, I guess that's really that's really what's this, different this, I guess, time. this time. So it's different. It's different because the economic facts around it are different. That's your theory. Yeah, I, right. I think because I'm going to throw another theory I want to get you guys to take. It's Trump they're talking <laughs> down the economy, talking down the market. Trump, Trump has made everything more toxic. And that this time there's an election next year. And yield curve is a bearish economic conversation, so it's Trump. Well, yeah, that's, that's, there's something yeah. else too. I mean, we've talked before about how it has been an unloved bull run in equities that's for the true. last couple of years, right? And so the pundits on the news have been talking about talking about it. It's it's fallen on deaf ears a lot. It's of the times. first time post 08. Yeah, it, yeah, and and this time there's actually yeah. a, a legitimate metric that they can count on. And say, okay, haha, this time I'm really calling it. All right, mm-hmm. and that's different. It hasn't happened in the last couple of years. It's very very good point, Dale. What were you gonna say? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, I think that has a lot to do with it. I think Trump pointing out the Fed, saying that they're against, shedding a lot of light on what the Fed's doing and how it's the Fed's fault and pointing fingers. And, and what about Dudley's op-ed? Did you, yeah. you know, that, that's... Yeah, I have it up here yeah. on the screen now, so let's get our listeners up to speed yeah. here. You have uh, Bill Dudley, who was the vice chair of the Fed for a long time, throughout the whole Obama years, oversaw that uh, seven-year ZERP policy of zero interest rates. And then he came out this morning, and I want to quote word for word because I don't want to uh, misrepresent what he's saying. So when I quote his words, you would think that I'm less susceptible to being accused of misrepresentation, (laughs) Um, although even that is not totally safe. It's crazy. Officials could state explicitly that the central bank won't bail out an administration that keeps making bad choices on trade policy, making it abundantly clear that Trump will have to own the consequences of his actions said Mr. Dudley. 
So these are word for word quotes from the assistant vice chair. Essentially, I don't want to say he's implying. I think he's stating that the Fed should not raise rates because then it will be up to Trump to have lower to deal rates. with the. Re- Excuse me, that they should not lower rates because that would be a form of bailing out Trump, and that Trump should not get the Fed bailing him out. First question. Is this appropriate for him to say? It isn't. Second question, do they all think this way and he just said it? Hopefully not. God forbid. (laughs) Third question, will anyone listen to him? Are there Fed governors that are saying, you know, they're right. We just got to stick it to Trump here. Yeah, I I mean, uh, what happened to that whole independence thing? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Can't have it both ways. Yeah, I got to be consistent on it. See, my thing is that you can't have it both ways. The, uh, my whole point was Trump was just calling out what we already know is that it's not really independent. We call it independent. So we got more structural independence than they do in Japan and Europe. But but functionally, the notion of that complete Chinese wall between fiscal monetary policy has always been ridiculous. Their point, their political positions, they're not elected, but yeah. they're political. They're appointed by uh, the president and and approved by the Senate. So Trump called out the hypocrisy of it on one side. And then all the Trump supporters said, yeah, good. He's de- he's calling it like it is. The Fed needs to do this. And then now he's doing it on the other side. And people are like, wait a second. What about independence? I have a question. You might know this. How much has his PAC raised for for Warren at this point in time? Because this seems a lot like positioning going forward for him. Yeah. No, he. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised um, if there's, you know, these bureaucrats tend to bureaucrat. I wouldn't well, be surprised. I mean, he's a left-wing guy. Yeah, yeah. And that's the implication. Sure. It's, you know, don't lower rates and that will hurt Trump's getting reelected. Yeah. You know, that's the implication. It's very political. It's it's uh, reckless. So, Julian, I, I guess my question is this. Did Trump bring it on himself in this sense? Um, he There's two messages that we have gotten loud and clear. And I and I and I'm right now reporting the news. This is my fair and balanced presentation of two facts. One, Trump has told us something in the range of 50 times a day for roughly 300 days. Economy is the best ever. Economy is the best ever. Never seen anything like it. This is this economy is literally ridiculous. Like I cannot believe how good it is. That's one message. Number two, the Fed has got to lower rates and got to do QE emergency economic actions. Because it's just so bad, we have to get the Fed involved. Has the president said both those things? Am I being fair to him? And how do you circle those two things together? Um, well, I guess he, the economy has been really strong. The earnings have been amazing uh, despite the environment. So I guess he feels like he's in a strong position to uh, you know, go to war with China. Uh, and you know, uh, the rates and the Fed will do whatever it takes to to help him and you know and that's kind of what's ha- what's happened last one year already you know the fed going from raising rates to now lowering rates and and another two cuts are priced in by the end of the year so i think it's just uh, he keeps an eye on the market like like we do and uh, and if he sees you know that uh, that is a uh, trade war really is starting to hurt the economy i would bet that you know and his re-election uh, potential he will he will do something, but it's still a year away, so he has plenty of time, I guess. So I probably, you know, the thing we have to keep in mind is his agenda. Um, and so there's no, you know, I guess last year the market tanked 20% because of the Fed. This year it's tanking because of trade war. I think he can probably afford to wait, you know, another six months because you don't have to put your to your votes uh, until when uh, until November next year, right? So there's plenty of time for, for him to... Uh, to uh, change his uh, narrative, I guess, on China. I don't. I don't sure if I agree with that. I don't think that that's a real time thing. That like how people feel about the economy the day before the election is how they vote. I think it bakes in a narrative at least six months, yeah. if not twelve months in advance. I think that may not the in, day, in, but I guess. But like in the of summer time. of t- of twenty twelve, Romney was trying to run on the economy being bad under Obama. It had been bad in ten and eleven, and it was not great in twelve. But it was good enough that on a directional sense, I think voters felt better and it wasn't enough of a play to for uh, Romney to get an edge with uh, with Obama there in 12. In 04, in the reverse parties, Kerry tried the same with Bush Jr. And, and, and the economy started to turn down later, but it just wasn't that right, that right message. But the best example for, it, for with the economy being bad and having gotten better and yet it didn't matter, it was 92 when Clinton beat Bush Sr. The economy really bottomed in uh, 18 months before the election, 
and and you couldn't change the narrative that way. And so I, I definitely agree with you that in theory it seems like, and from a policy standpoint, there's time to reverse course. But um, the lag effect of this, it, let's say that he ends up reversing course with China. It's not going to be tomorrow, right? So let's say it's yeah. a few more months. Could be by the end of the year, I guess. Yeah, by end of the year, yeah. and then business. But but for you're still dealing with a backlog with non-started projects from the trade war of this year that maybe don't come back online for six months after that or a year after that. Uh, the, the, to me, if that's what he's thinking, that I can just flick a switch and get everyone feeling good about the economy again in six months and I still have time before the election, by then you've had all these debates, all these primaries, all this activity, and all of it will have centered around a conversation of negativity in the economy, not positivity in the economy. I don't see how he could possibly reverse that by then. That's but, just my, that's so then, my take. then you think he's, he's really believes he's the one and he's going to do this, whatever it takes, even if he means losing the election. You mean the chosen one or just yeah, the one? Yeah, the chosen <laughs> one. <laughs> no comment. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think that... Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't want to get overly political with it, but what's in the mind of the president on this? I mean, who the heck knows? I I um, I do think that he uh, every single day is torn on that issue. He, on one hand, believes that he has leverage with his base to just press with China and that people won't turn on him. And I think he just looks up at the screen, and if the stock market's not crashing, he kind of feels better. Then the stock market drops 600 points, and all of a sudden he has to unwind it. Uh, but I do not believe that there's I, – I, this I actually am very confident of. I don't think he has any strategy or certainty of, of where he's trying to get this to go strategically. There's, he's not playing chess on this. This is day by day, finger in the dam, figuring it out as he goes. I think generally, I mean, he has – a genuine desire to renegotiate the trade deal with China. And I, I, I sure. of course, respect that completely. I think there's enough time before the election and the economy is is doing quite well where you kind of have the luxury of, of duke, duking it out, so to speak. And I'm curious, as I think we all are, to see how that changes as we get closer to the election. But I mean, as of right now, he's doing this. It's causing ripples in markets and those types of things, no question. Is it really hurting the economy in the United States? It technically isn't all that much. I mean, consumer sentiment is is high. It's it came in hotter than expected for this month of August with volatility that we've had markets are down. So is the consumer a leading or lagging indicator? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. It's, uh, well what's it's the a, answer? It's though, a lagging. lagging yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. talking about Business, rhetorically, yeah. but the listeners don't know. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Consumer's yeah, a lagging right. indicator, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Is it hurting business confidence? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hurting CapEx. It's hurting business confidence, those types of things. But unemployment is three point seven percent and you're getting lower interest rates out of it. So there's some some positive things in the economy. And, and so my point is just the, the question of whether it's a genuine, des genuine desire to really change the world and change things between China. I hope that's the case. And we'll have to see as the election gets closer. Yeah. 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 I, I agree. I, I, yeah, I agree with that. And I think uh, like, like David said, it's just all about the market. I think that he uses that as the scorecard. And if the market's higher, you know, come election time, uh, I'm sure he's going to market just that. Uh, I, I think that uh, who, who knows as far as, uh, what his genuine desires are. I do think he really believes strongly about this China thing. I just don't know where uh, where he, yeah, as far as any strategy goes or any, any long-term deal, I think it's a kind of just whatever he's feeling at the moment, which is kind of, which kind of freaks me out a little bit, but, but uh, I, I, yeah, well, it, it's, it's going to continue. So I was thinking like, if we put ourselves in the Chinese shoes for a minute, like, what would we, what would you do? I was thinking like, if, that was me at the negotiating table. I would say I have another year, year and a half of this until we have the election. Here's, the, would... here's the wild card though, Julian. I'm with you 100%. Mm -hmm. And if they had uh, just omniscience like... to say Joe Biden was going to win, I think they would say, you know what? Trump is a vulnerable. Let's ride this out. Let's not only ride it out and see if he loses, but let's ride it out and help see that he loses. Exactly. Yeah, meddling. But mm -hmm. what if they now believe it's not going to be Joe Biden? It will be Elizabeth Warren. Who, in a lot of ways, you could argue, is a China hawk in the same mold as Trump, it, it, but perhaps even worse, in that she's also willing to tax the heck out of the American people, which impedes their ability to buy stuff from China. Mm -hmm. I, I think Wiz Warren is a wild card here. If I'm doing very simplistic calculus along the lines of what you're saying, but if I'm China and we're now at this stage in the calendar. Mm -hmm. I'm saying let's ride out Trump and get Biden. We'll get a better deal. Or if Trump looks like he's going to win, we'll say let's get a deal with Trump now. We don't want to deal with him second term. But then Liz Warren enters the picture and you go, ah, you know what? 
Trump could lose. We get a better thing, but then it's Warren that could be worse. I don't know what I don't know what they're thinking. I, I assume yeah. they think Warren would probably be more rational than Trump. I, I mean, well, uh, rat, or, but they don't need rat. Like you mean, or at least tweet, uh, not tweet silly. Th- th- yeah, this somebody's is, they, not very emotionally driven. Or, yeah, but I don't uh, think temperament of, matters to them. I also think is she going to give him a better deal? I, I, no. I, yeah, I I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I agree. She's I much more. Worse deal she's much more aligned with Trump. Uh, she could Trump pick up ten percent of goes. Trump's base. She could pick up some of that nationalist populist base by her first thing in office being some some big protectionist uh, nationalist. What she she's calling it economic patriotism. <laughs> don't get me started. But my point being, I I, I think Warren could give him a worse deal. Yeah, well, well, she, she's more focused too on labor cost differentials. I would imagine yeah. too. So that's one of China's biggest fears is the the moving to lower cost supply chains, which is happening. You know, we're seeing Vietnam and whatnot. So she would probably have less of a focus on the IP side of things, which is arguably what what I think is most important about me, a trade deal going forward. But yeah. yeah, I think she's she's pretty scary to the Chinese government at that point. What well, would be interesting with Warren, and I'm not going to say anything to compliment her because I don't have much to say to compliment her. <laughs> but one thing Warren would do is whatever her agenda was with it. She would publicly articulate what the her agenda is. Where what Trump will do is, let's say IP is his agenda, he'll then say tariffs and and trade deficit, and he and he pollutes the issue because he goes back and forth. I think that confuses markets. Where Warren would just say it's about labor cost differentials, and she'll and she'll match her message with her agenda. Mm-hmm. For and even though it was a message and agenda, I probably disagree with. She'll match the two where, where Trump kind of uses one thing to justify another. It gets a little confusing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Let me let me put an end to the Trump political stuff. I'm going to borrow from my friend Rich Lowry at National Review when we move from one conversation topic to the next. And he and he, fig, he finishes it with an exit question. So I'm going to go around the circle real quickly. Uh, Brian, as it pertains to Trump, Twitter, trade war, yield curve inversion. One month from now, is the yield curve still inverted? Yes. Julian. Yes, very much. Very much, meaning inverted well, further mean, than one basis point. The two ten. Oh, uh, the two ten. Yeah, still I guess. Still, still inverted. Yeah. yeah. Wider, wider Probably. inversion. Probably. Probably. Okay. Dave. Uh, I I just can't f- see reasons. I'm trying to find reasons why it wouldn't be. Um, as far as growth goes or good economic data, but I I just don't see it in the short term. So yeah, I'm gonna say yes, it's still inverted. Mm-hmm. I think it'll float around where it's at, but eventually end up more inverted one month from now. Correct answer is still inverted a month from now, very likely has nothing to do with growth. The thing that could change it is if the Fed shocks markets 50 with base. 50 at mm-hmm. once, mm-hmm. Yep. Um, but, it could potentially get about 10 points of still flat, but not inverted differential. Mm-hmm. Next topic. What is an investor to do? We have Trump, Twitter, trade war, volatility is the rule. So then you say, how do I play it? You have cash to put to work. You're not already invested. Let's just take for granted for a second. You're already invested and your portfolio is properly allocated, Brian. So let's assume that guy or gal is leaving their portfolio in place, but a new person comes in and says, I've never had any money. I got cash. I turned on the news a couple of days ago. We were up 800 points. I turned down uh, the next day. It was down 900. Is this an environment to put cash to work? Um, it, it It is. It's still an environment to put cash to work. Uh, that all said, you know, it's all indicative of the individual's personal goals, risk tolerance in the, in the whole deal. So when we're putting this stuff to work, we're designing. What if one of their goals is to make money? Uh, then it's just a matter of time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we, I just, we've got a time. Yeah, I can't go that easy. Um, yeah. yeah, no, no, no. I look. There's there's still opportunities there. I mean, there's there's leadership groups in the equity market, staples, utilities, such things like that. There's great values out there. We've been adding to the portfolio. So if if we didn't feel like there was opportunity, we wouldn't be doing that. That said, yeah, it's a time to be ca- you know to to use caution when you're allocating portfolios. I think um, there's opportunities in stocks and bonds and alternatives. We'd still put money to work. I think we do it in a, in a tactical way, and I think we'd be thoughtful about it. And uh, but yeah, that's still it's still time to add. Julian, would you uh, recommend somebody put cash to work in the in the stock portion of their portfolio? And then after you answer that, what about the bond portion of their portfolio? Yeah, I still very much think equities are you know the uh, what we say, keep saying. Uh, there's a, there is no alternative. I mean, you make uh, the yield on the S and P is about two percent now, and it's more that you would make on the th- Thirty year uh, that went to below two percent for the first time today. I think it's at one point nine. So there is no alternative. There, I mean, for sure, the one thing you don't want is to have cash. Then it's a question of how you're going to allocate between equities, bonds. Uh, we've we have seen a massive rally, but if we keep uh, 
you know, having uh, this trend of lower rates around the world, there's no reason why um, the bonds you have in your portfolio can't, you know, they're going to keep following the uh, the rates. And if they keep going lower around the world, they're going to, the yield are going to go lower. So your bonds uh, are going to appreciate. And then also, so given the higher volatility, a good time to have a, a large allocation to alternatives. All in at once if someone has cash or tether it in? Well, given the volatility, I would say probably tether. Um, you know, use the opportunities of the big swings to, uh, you know, to add on weakness and, um, and um, you know, over, over time. We are a like-minded investment <laughs> committee, aren't we, my friend? <laughs> Dea, what are your thoughts on this cash and market? Uh, uh, let's focus on that bond part for a little bit. I actually would have very little emotional or psychological resistance to putting money into equities at this point. And yet I fi- I would find it even harder to put money into a bond market where the 10 years at 1.4% or 30 years at uh, 19 Um Asset allocation doesn't care about those emotional timing, uh, event driven nuances. You're supposed to put money to work, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's hard not to go with the consensus on this one. I think that if you already have a well, consensus exposure, in this room, yeah, consensus okay. in this room. If you already have exposure to fixed income, I find it very difficult to add in this environment. Sure, yields could continue to grind lower, and your bonds could see some price appreciation. But if you're looking for a total return, I think there's there's still a lot of value in the equity market. Uh, you know, multiples are reasonable. I don't think they're stretched if you normalize for how low yields are. And yeah, there's still some opportunities out there. So I, I like I like uh, adding to equities. And uh, like Julian said, if if you get some downswings and you can uh, get a bargain in certain names, I think it's uh, it's you should take advantage of the opportunity. But Robert, let's let's play off of Dea's last sentence there, though. Uh, let's assume that structurally you're on the same page that the rest of us are about this issue. But now let's change it to what he said, certain names. Would you feel the same for an index investor going into the S&P 500 as you would a Bonson Group dividend growth investor buying individual names that might be at more compelling values than the S&P 500, which, correct me if I'm wrong, is still trading 17x forward. Mm-hmm. That's right. yeah. yeah, so one of my favorite tools, metrics to look at is the Fed model. So looking at the yield on the 10-year versus the, the yield in, on the S&P. No one did the right. Fed has ever called it yeah, the that's Fed right. model. I know, I know. <laughs> Your Ardeni did a good job of placing it there. Um, <laughs> but that, that can be dangerous, I think, to your point, because I think now if you're going to get paid – via positive cash flow dividends, et cetera, you need to make sure that you're getting paid adequately first and foremost, but that also the underlying balance sheets are, are very fortified. And I think that's what we do really well here is that we're looking at a bottom up level at, you know, where is the cash coming from? Is it sustainable? You know, there's a lot of names in the S&P when you buy that basket that are, you know, the bad lumped in with the good, of course. Yeah. I, I, I think that, um, that what we're facing right now is interesting in that there's a heavy temptation to pretend like we've not seen this before, where there are uh, difficulties in making decisions about putting cash to work. Uh, But the thing is that normally that question would come in clearly bubblicious valuations. I am far more sensitive to wanting to tether and and hold back and have heavy cash reserves when the S&P is trading at 22 times earnings than I am just because we've had three weeks of volatility. I think that deploying money in a volatile market, as particularly as you said, by us tethering it in day by day on on those days of weakness, actually I think is really attractive. I really like the idea of doing it. Valuation bubbles are harder to invest in. Day by day volatility, I, there's just no record of that not being a, a good entry point for yeah, investors. It ends up being an attractive, uh, positive, actually. You, yeah. get, you get lower prices as you buy in, absolutely. So what's yeah. getting cheapest? We're not talking about individual stocks, but let's talk sectors in the market. Let's talk asset classes. I'm going to go around the room uh, with a different asset class, emerging markets, where we think there. It's difficult for us because our emerging market strategy is doing very well. Index is getting hit. What do we think? Index is getting hit. I mean, I think there's uh, currency at play, global trade war. Obviously, those things really do matter. Um, from a valuation standpoint, highly attractive. And I mean, the strategy that we're using, focusing on the consumer in the emerging market, I think is still the right play. Um, I think so there's opportunity there. So I, I would be adding to emerging market at this level, but I would not be doing it because I thought Yuan was going to go below seven again or and or, you know, there's going to be a trade deal. I would be doing it just basically on fundamentals, bottom up research on individual companies, 
looking at um, the, just the fact that you're buying a higher growth rate in the emerging world than you're buying in the United States at a much lower multiple. Much Beautiful. lower. Yeah. Small cap, Julian. What do you think? A small cap, frothy U.S. equity. Um, I guess it's, uh, you know, typically small cap is going to get hit harder than large caps uh, just because, um, you know, uh, investors fly to safety and they feel like large caps are, are going to be, uh, you know, safer than smaller caps. So you probably have, you know, uh, great opportunities in smaller caps. Um, you know, if we look, if I look at our portfolio, we have, a, you know, a dividend yield that's twice the dividend yield of the S&P uh, 500. And we have a beta that's, you know, around 0.8, 0.75. So I, that's more like defensive, and we have some small caps in there, and they contribute to that to that yield. And and I guess it's I think it's about you know the, we should talk about sectors as well. Yeah. There's been a big move in sectors. So I don't know if you're gonna ask Daya later. But, well, we'll start it off, and then we'll go to yeah. Daya. Uh, pick one sector. What uh, as again, it, it's a top down question, energy. and we're bottom up people. But is energy the most Ener attractive sector? Well, energy has been this month. And I want to be out. clear. But this is August of 2019. I'm asking this <laughs> because if you feel like you heard it in January of 19, <laughs> July of 18, May of 17. This has yeah. been several years. Energy has been the most undervalued. Yeah. And it's been very interesting months. There's been a lot of, uh, if you look uh, at you know, sector rotation, there's been sectors like real estate, utilities, consumer staple, like the safe, you know, safe haven um, sectors, uh, not uh, impacted by trade war too much, have been outperforming, and sectors like financials and energy and all the cyclical like industrials have been very weak this month. So there's, you know, there's trading opportunities there as well. Yeah. Sectors. That's a, that's, a, that's a good answer, Julian. It's you stealing all my. It's almost like we sit <laughs> together. All the sectors. So. Yeah. Um, we. I think. I feel like we're we're agreeing a lot this session. Normally, normally is a bit more. I think a bit more dissent. I'm holding back yeah. at the conclusion oh, yeah. I when I stuff. when there's okay. no one that can rebut me and I just okay. get the last word. I'm going to let everyone know where you guys have been okay, wrong. Okay. Perfect. 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 <laughs> all right. The, uh, the an avalanche is coming towards the yeah. end that I can't wait for. Uh, yeah. As far as sectors go, look, I, I energy has been underperforming this year. I think there's a lot of opportunities in the energy space. I think it's misunderstood by the market, uh, even though it, oil, I think it's still around 20% uh, year-to-date, uh, has increased, and uh, you haven't seen any any sort of love from some of these energy stocks that are, uh, if you look at yield contribution, make a significant uh, uh, portion of that uh, 4% that Julian was talking about. So, yeah, I, I like energy. I'm a fan. I hate to jump on the bandwagon, but energy, yeah. I think, has a lot of things going for it. Uh, we talked about a certain Middle East uh, IPO upcoming, and so they're very interested in sustaining uh, higher energy prices leading up into that. Um, when people talk about energy, too, domestically, they're generally thinking of you know oil, you know, gasoline for cars, things like that. But the petrochemical side of it, too, is, is really interesting, right? And the, the, the refineries that generate those materials, they still need pipelines to feed them as well. And I think those those types of uh, companies and sectors have been uh, a little bit undervalued, to say the least, over the last uh, couple of years, really, at this point. So you have an energy um, infrastructure story that looks attractive, and it sounds like you're saying you have a utility story that's overvalued. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would, I would say so. I think it's had a great run. I think uh, if you look at multiples of utility companies, they're in the twenties um, across the board. I mean, the entire index. So think, think about that. Uh, yeah, a utility company at twenty x. Yeah, it doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, on the energy side, I mean, I would agree generally. I think there's opportunity there. I think you've got WTI at fifty or getting close to going below, mm -hmm. and I think that starts to to curtail capex in the U.S., and so we slow production a little bit, and then the pendulum send, tends to swing back the other way a little bit, and you get an increase in prices, and it kind of round and round we go. So I think from an op opportunity standpoint, as we sit here today, I would agree that there's opportunity there. I would also say the financials have obviously underperformed recently, and uh, many trading below book value, and if you look at, what was it, um, Nassim Taleb, the, uh, don't tell me what you think of the world. Tell me what's in your portfolio. Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. So mm -hmm. if you look at the, look at ours, we're we're looking at financials as Don't tell me as what well. you think. Show me what's in your portfolio. Yeah, Is a no. skin in the game kind of concept. skin in the mm -hmm. game exactly. So financials obviously show uh, some promise here, and many trading just at dirt cheap levels below. Twenty two percent of our dividend growth portfolio yeah. right now from a sector <clears throat> allocation. Yeah. yeah, that's our biggest sector allocation. Um, and, um, but it includes it includes asset managers and a little big bank and a little insurance. We're not going to say names on this podcast. I uh, I guess I have a question though: Is the utility thing overpriced, or is the yield surrogate, you know, bond surrogate story overpriced? What or is it is it Both. part and parcel the same? 
kind of, it's all relative to each other. So I guess if, you know, uh, if we assume that the, you know, tenure is what it is and it's just going one direction, then there's, you know, uh, what you were talking about, the risk premium mm. um, is, is pretty interesting. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's the 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 yield you you make on the S and P is around five point eight percent now. Uh, um, at seventeen times, that's five point eight, right? Yield equivalent. So, and if, and hmm. on our portfolio, we are more around thirteen times P. So that our yield is much higher. So I feel pretty good about owning stocks at thirteen times P, yeah. yielding four yeah. percent, yeah. when you can make one and a half owning uh, a ten-year U.S. government bond. So, so we're talking about utilities being a little overpriced. We're talking about financials, energy, some of the dividend stuff that we really believe in may, be, being underpriced. But we're not talking about Fang. We're not talking about big tech. What about uh, the idea that the as big tech goes, so goes the market? Is that dead? Uh, I, I think that uh, as far as growth, like very growthy names go, uh, especially in that's something that traditionally, obviously, we stay away from. Uh, primarily because a lot, a lot of those companies uh, don't have really any earnings. They're over investing. There's a lot of hype to the name. People tend to overbuy stories. Names that have uh, great stories aren't necessarily good investments. If you look at the historical record, uh, in a low rate environment, I think the market think th th those. Uh, I think those growth companies. Julie and I were talking about this. They normally get a disproportionately get a higher multiple because the the cash flow from those companies is so far in the future, and if you lower the discount rate, it brings all that that cash forward a little bit more than it does for companies that have maybe a, st a more stable cash profile over the years. All right. So what you just said, which is 100% accurate, yeah, yeah. but if we kind of brought it down to, to a little bit dumbed down version, you just said that they're play on multiple expansion that you hope to get from a lower uh, interest rate. I, a lower risk-free rate in the society. I, I think that there's uh, going to be... Uh, look, I don't know what so kind of risk... So the tenure is at 1.3. Yeah. So um, how are we doing there? Like how much more room is there to go of high-tech, high-PE, high-beta names getting more expensive because of the cost of funds getting lower? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. There isn't a lot of room for the cost of funds to go lower. I imagine... I mean, given from today's conversation, it sounds like you guys think there's a reasonable likelihood they go to zero. Uh, in which case, in which case, I think that multiple would definitely be affected. But then you're then you're buying because you're trying to uh, predict what rates are going to do, which I, I think uh, is is a bit outrageous. So mm -hmm. we we try to stay away from those uh, out, you know those predictions as much as possible. And only only on thing the dumber than trying to uh, predict. Bond prices off of interest rate projections is trying to predict stock prices <laughs> off of interest rate projections. Big tech, cool tech, new tech. Are we in the 14th inning of a nine inning game? I think we are. And I, I've never really liked, uh, you know, that FANG classification because these, you know, while they were, were leaders for the last couple of years in the markets, they're very different companies a lot of times, too. And so at what point are, you know, investors going to get tired of funding different projects that aren't revenue generating, right? And I also like to look at which companies are generating revenue and from which sources. I mean, is ad revenue going to be a very sustainable mm -hmm. source of revenue in the coming years? Mm -hmm. um, or is it something more consumer driven? Is it people actually spending money on goods and services that they'll still spend money on in a downturn? Mm -hmm. So I think the, the FANG um, dispersion will be a story people are talking about here in the coming months and years. That's a great point. I think uh, understanding whether the companies in your portfolio, whether you would be happy holding those through a recession. Mm -hmm. And it's a question we always ask ourselves with the names we own. So. And price matters. You know, the entry point on one, any of those stories yeah. or any of those theses matter when you're looking at multiples at 50 times, 70 times earnings, something like that. You know, it, it mutes returns for decades. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's just an entry point. Um, if you're looking at, can those those names go higher here? Are we at the end of the bull market? Of course they can go higher. And of course multiples can get stretched more and those things happen. It's not something that we're going to likely own just because of those reasons. But that doesn't mean that they can't go higher from here. But I think over the long term, you really do got to focus on the fundamentals. You got to look at what's happening from the income statement, the balance sheet, and make those decisions accordingly. So I'm I'm really uh, philosophically committed to the idea that the allocation we have into bonds is uh, is driven by the discipline of asset allocation and the notion of of a defensive play. Mm -hmm. I I we talked about the possibility of the ten year. Don't get me wrong, Dale. When we talk about the ten year going from one four to potentially just above zero. Um, something with a zero handle, like 0 0.8, 0 0.7. Yeah. 
I would put the odds of greater than fifty percent that that'll happen. That we'll have a yield sub one percent on the ten year at some point here, based entirely on the global technicals of of sixteen trillion of negative yielding debt. But I would not suggest, and I don't think anyone at this table would, that we want our bond allocation because we're trying to capture price appreciation of bonds of a yield going from one four to point eight. I would suggest keeping bond allocation to defend what that deflationary pressure may mean to equity prices. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have a justification for bond ownership, even in this rate environment. We uh, have talked pretty thoroughly about our views on equities, valuations, index, individual names, sectors. Then we're going to come back into alternatives. Now tell me, Julian, you spent a lot of time at hedge funds in your career. You understand philosophically at the Bonson group, how we position the alternative investment asset class um, why should I not be thinking about alternatives, something we already overweighted coming into this year, to overweight it even more? Well, um, I think you you definitely want to overweight uh, in alternatives and probably even more these days because, you know, the, uh, it's been a tough 10 years for uh, alternative managers with the S&P, you know, going up 15% every year and, and having z- very little volatility. So it's very hard to outperform on your hedge fund um, doing, uh, you know, uh, when the market is just uh, trending up every year with no volatility. But these days seems to be over. I mean, I guess since... Our friends at Strategus Research call it the everybody gets a trophy market. <laughs> yeah. That, so that because, of, because of QE and zero bound, exactly. yeah. that it was impossible for any risk asset manager to not make money. So it's, it's easy to feel, you know, smart just because you were along the market. The market was going up. So these are days where... Alternative managers should outperform, where they can, you know, uh, use the volatility to their benefit. And 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 when you have a market that's sideways, um, you know, that's an al- interesting alternative to uh, to generate alpha in your yeah. portfolio. A big something I've, I, we always see in the news all these reports of outflows from hedge funds and alternatives and whatnot. But I mean, you know, literally speaking, how many outflows do we see some, from some of our big, very good hedge funds? Very, very little oftentimes, right? And- uh, yeah, that's right. But I guess my question is, are outflows an indicator of um, an asset you want to be avoiding or an asset you want to be buying? Well, I think it's all a factor of the focus on averages. I mean, if you look at a hedge fund average or an index, if that's even a real right. thing, it's irrelevant completely. You're, you're By definition, you're looking for alpha generation and talent in those yeah. spaces. And so I think people generally don't understand that. The, the focus should be on alpha generation, risk reduction, volatility dampening, things like that. But I would agree to what you implied, which is when there's outflows, you know, you got to look at that. Um, and I would say it's a contrarian indicator to consider the asset class generally. I mean, the, the alternative, quote unquote, space is very broad. So we're talking yeah. about different managers, mm-hmm. different strategies yeah. can mean about yeah. a million different things. It's a very unfortunate thing. And you bo- both you and I started our careers at UBS. They had a the head of alternative investment research back in the early 2000s who wrote a paper that really changed my life. I mean that. Mm-hmm. Alexander Einheiken wrote a piece about fireflies, but it was essentially arguing that the alternative investments are not an asset class. They are, they are asset managers. Mm-hmm. And we have to refer to it as an asset mm-hmm. class yeah. for classification uh, purposes. But really... The very clever answer one of you could have given to my quote trick question, I guess, <laughs> is you can't. Ta- I can't answer if alternative investments are attractive or not in this environment. I got to know what alternative investments we're talking about. That's true. I mean, I think you could say t- t- the same thing about the stocks. You know, I, I you yeah. know, if we're talking no, about but I, but I just- disagree because stocks have a beta. Yeah, there's a beta. Right, you just see what I'm saying. The whole point of alternatives is you're not referring to the beta of an asset class. Mm-hmm. The dispersion of results in stocks is very narrow. The dispersion of results among alternatives is very broad. You, you know what I'm saying? It can be, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Top performers in the alternative space versus bottom performers yeah. are far wider than than you would see in equities. Yeah, long mm-hmm. long. and when I when I when we say alternatives, obviously you can have a, an alternative manager who just trades like Ackman, who just trades equities. So so I, clearly, there's many different types of strategies. When we say alternatives, I, I automatically think the 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 uh, talent that we own in our portfolio. Sure. That, mm-hmm. That's that's what I'm thinking, and sure. okay. right, and and as far as uh, as far as alts go, I I think look, you, you make a a point for the bond market being significantly overvalued, uh, stocks in some areas being overvalued. There's a lot of volatility. Uh, I mean, I think it's a it's a great great environment for alts. And going back to the everybody gets a trophy, I think the best statistic uh, that demonstrates that is the uh, 
the Russell 2000. I think uh, about over 50% of the companies in the Russell 2000 don't have uh, positive earnings. And that number is astronomically high given, given the historical record. So yeah, if, uh, you know, there's been a lot of cheap money out there. It's been keeping a lot of you know, companies, uh, companies going in this market. Uh, so I think there's a lot of stuff to avoid in the stock market and the bond market, and, and alternatives is a good place to look. So, so I'll, I'll end us up here. We're, we're out of time, so I'm going to do an exit question to bring us to the end, and, and we'll go around the room here. Everyone give a quick answer, and we'll call it quits, and we'll be reconvening again next week. Uh, August is going to end here another 48 hours. Uh, all likelihood, we're going to end the month slightly negative return in equities, meaning single digits, uh, less than 5% down on the month, uh, you know, so bottom month, one of only two down months so far in the year, but not, not a pretty situation, big up month for bonds alternatives. Again, to your point, day looks like it's been a, a good month there. Asset allocation. Is it the, uh, a winner in this environment or do we need to think differently about asset allocation, about that whole philosophy when you have a month like this, Robert, what say you about the time-tested principle of asset allocation? I, I think it's just that it's timeless, and I think right now is a great example of that. Um, you know, bonds were very unloved last year, and then into this year, and they've done a great job, yeah. right? Brian, asset allocation. No, I think it's timeless and evergreen as well. And if you look at this month and or this year, really, I would look at 2019. And, you know, the nice thing is last year it didn't, well, it still worked, but technically every asset class was negative last year. It doesn't matter what you choose. Everything was down this year. Technically, most things, almost everything is up. You could look at some commodities and things. So while it's evergreen and you should always look at that, uh, not just from a risk standpoint, but from a return standpoint, um, it happens to be that 2019, you've really had a tailwind because bonds are up 8%. So, you know, the stocks are up as well. Mm. So yeah, it's worked out well. Yeah. Julian? Hard to add uh, too much to that. I agree with uh, what you guys are saying. I guess if you take a step back and look, you know, at uh, history, um, it was relatively small move, at least in equities in, in August. And, and we see a big moves in, in bonds, but still, you know, uh, probably not in us to justify uh, really changing too much. Yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, when we say asset allocation, I think it means something a little bit different than uh, most everybody else. Where I think when other people say it, it just tends to mean over diversification. Mm -hmm. We will purposefully stay away from certain asset classes or sub asset classes if we think we can't make money in them or there's too much risk. So I, I think there's always considerations to be made. Regarding asset classes and and uh, and shifting things like the bonds traditionally are a safe investment, but maybe there's an environment where there's more interest rate risk, and we have to trim our exposure a little bit. So, uh, yeah, we're always uh, adjusting our capital market expectations, but the overall uh, you know method of kind of putting some money in stocks and you know a portfolio approach rather than uh, making a bet on a certain. Uh, asset class so still we will have yeah. overweights and underweights in different broad asset classes at any given point in time but the asset allocation contra market timing i want to be in right now i want to be out right now that's sort of what i'm getting at as yeah, oh, a got binary it, got it, got it, yeah, decision yeah. we're all on board no time to get yeah. cute with market timing by the way here's the irony and i'll finish the exit question with my own exit comment it's not just the, all what all my colleagues and partners here have said is correct about asset allocation. It's that asset allocation is most beneficial in this period of time. It's not that it's still beneficial, it's optimally beneficial. You don't even need asset allocation if everything's going up at once, because and you don't need it when everything's going down at once. It doesn't protect when everything goes down at once. And when everything's going up at once, you can just pick one thing and you're getting the up. It's when you have zigs and zags, and it's because of the folly of market timing. And market timing is very difficult to do when month you have a really bad month and a really good month. People are not good at picking their entry months, but they sure as you know what are not good at picking their entry days, their exit days. You drop 600, you go, you know what, we got more 500 points more downside, I'm getting out. And then you go up 400 the next day, and you go, okay, I got to get back in. And then it's down 800, and you go, okay, I can't take it, I'm back in, up 200, up 300, okay, good, I got back into the right time. Oh, shoot, now we're down 500 again. This is the stuff that humiliates people. And the only way to avoid it is to not play that nonsensical game. Asset allocation protects you from that folly, from that behavioral lack of wisdom. So asset allocation is not only the friend of the investor, it's the friend of human nature. 
That's my exit comment. Guys, thanks very much. Yep. Naya, Robert, Brian, All right. Julian, the investment committee here at the Bonson Group with this week's Dividend Cafe. We will talk again next week after Labor Day, after USC starts their season 1-0. Mm. <laughs> <laughs>